Ливии. Conservative diving, calculating and mitigating the risk of decompression sickness by Dr. Peter De Noble. Diving conservatively has become advice recreational divers receive quite commonly. It is frequently followed by generic instructions such as don't push the no decompression limits, use nitrox, limit your depth, do not exert yourself underwater, be hydrated or stay warm. The apparent intent of this advice is to reduce the risk of decompression sickness. To dive conservatively seems like common sense advice with regards to decompression safety. But the efficacies of the suggested strategies are generally not known and methods for their evaluation are not available. To better understand how divers can be more conservative in their choices, Let's consider how the current decompression rules were constructed and how effective they are. The first stage of development could be called trial and error. And the history of diving is a history of many trials and errors. A modern scientific approach was introduced in the development of decompression procedures at the turn of the 20th century. The trial and error methods became less futile and human toll of the failures were reduced thanks to the use of efficacy and effectiveness studies. Efficacy studies aimed to establish whether a particular decompression procedure worked and to determine the limits of its safe use. These can be done only in prospective studies by strictly controlling the experimental environments. The gold standard of efficacy studies in diving research is human decompression trials. Such trials were conducted by the US Navy Experimental Diving Unit in EDU and the Canadian Defence and Civil Institute of Environmental Medicine DCIM, and they evaluated several generations of US Navy and Canadian decompression tables. Similar studies were conducted by the French Navy and the Royal British Navy as well as some other navies of the world and to some extent by Dr. Albert Bielmann in Zurich, Switzerland. Effectiveness studies, on the other hand, evaluate real-life implementations of experimentally verified decompression methods. They are based on real-world data. One example of an effectiveness study, although it was not called that at the time, is a retrospective evaluation of 16,170 dives recorded by the US Naval Safety Center over the years 1971 to 1978. These real-world data were not available for all decompression schedules covered by the decompression tables, and in fact, only for 43 of the 295 US Navy air decompression schedules were used 100 times or more during that seven-year period. Half of the schedules were not used at all, the overall incidence rate of decompression sickness was 1.25%, meaning that one and a quarter of 100 individuals got decompression illness diving those tables. The incidence rate for schedules with more than 50 dives ranged from 1% to 4.8%. In general, the longer the dive, the higher the incidence of decompression sickness. Although the tables were developed based on empirical data, the number of depth time profiles tested and the number of trials were limited. Thus, the generalized model resulted in less than desirable safety in some schedules. Another example of an effectiveness study is the 1998 evaluation of the US Naval Medical Research Institute of real-world data pertaining to no-stop decompression dives reported by the US Naval Safety Center. The data consisted of 163,400 shallow dives made between 7 and 17 meters seawater within the no decompression limits. 48 cases of decompression sickness were reported between 1990 and 1994. The overall incidence rate for decompression sickness was 2.9 per 10,000 dives or 0.029%. When the dive time was 25% of the allowed no decompression time, DCS occurred in only one out of 
10,000 dives, or 0.01%, and it increased to 4 out of 10,000 dives, or 0.04%, when more than 75% of the allowed time was used. Now, how to apply these decompression models to recreational diving? Since the original studies, the US Navy has conducted several series of human trials and has developed more efficient models, but these were all designed primarily for Navy use. The Navy trials measured outcomes of decompression sickness symptoms and targeted probability of DCS at 2% or less, with 90% confidence that probably meant that it would be less than 5%. This approach is impractical for evaluating models designed for recreational diving. In the case of recreational diving, DCS risk is to be kept at less than 1% or a probability of DCS less than 0.01. To test models with such a low probability of DCS, even 100 symptom-free dives per schedule would not be enough. To prove with 90% confidence that the probability is less than 0.01, the trial would include nearly 300 dives. And this is just one point on the matrix of schedules that would have to be covered so thoroughly for the decompression model to be tested. In its human trials, the Canadian DCIEM used a surrogate outcome, venous gas emboli, which occur more often than decompression sickness symptoms and enable testing models with lower risks of decompression sickness. While the link between VGE grades and DCS onset is not straightforward, a grade of VGE2 or below is associated with a very safe dive. So the DCIM tables were designed to keep VGE, and with that DCS risk, low. This method may indeed be more appropriate for models developed for recreational diving. However, it is still complex to compute and prohibitively expensive for most manufacturers in the recreational dive market. Decompression models like those of the US Navy and DCIM, whose efficacy were tested in human trials, are known as so-called primary models. With the exception of the Buhlmann tables, most decompression tools in contemporary recreational diving, whether they are modified military tables or newly developed tables were not subject to systematic human trials and actually do not have efficacy data. They are so-called secondary models, which refer to the primary models for their safety margins. With regards to the allowable bottom times and prescribed decompression times, these models may vary between liberal US Navy and conservative DCIM prescriptions. Such calibration can easily be done for simple square dives, but when it comes to multi-level, repetitive and multi-day diving in a variety of environmental conditions, this method is far from reliable. In general, users of dive computers have the option to set their computers to be either less or more conservative. This is based on theoretical assumptions that the risk of DCS can be predictably diminished by limiting bottom time, slowing ascent, adding decompression stops, and increasing the partial pressure of oxygen. While these techniques work most of the time, voluntary variation of computing parameters may bend and tweak the decompression curve in unpredictable ways and lead to unwanted outcomes. Fortunately, most recreational dives occur within parameters of low enough decompression sickness risk that erroneous models will not cause undue harm to divers. When it comes to more serious diving, however, untested assumptions and erroneous computations may result in serious injuries. So how do we manage risk for tomorrow's divers? The public is becoming more aware that guesses and assumptions cannot replace evidence-based approaches when safety is the issue. Unfortunately, the likelihood is diminishing that human trials will be used for evaluating recreational diving practices. Modern society prohibits trials with humans and even animals unless the problem to be solved exceeds the potential harm to the subjects. Given the low overall risk of decompression sickness, testing the new decompression models to their limits would expose trial subjects to higher than the usual risks 
with a prospect of only a small gain for society. On the other hand, if advances in decompression safety depend only on existing experimental data, new computing technologies that become available won't be implemented to their fullest potential. Unlike experimental studies, real-world data are widely available and can be used to evaluate how effectively certain decompression methods are in preventing decompression sickness in real life. Real-world data may be used to evaluate the effectiveness of a single procedure with known efficacy or, as is most often the case, for comparative effectiveness research to compare two different methods for treating the same condition. An example of retrospective comparative effectiveness research was recently published about the incidence of decompression sickness after the recommendation of conservative decompression practices to divers with and without vascular right-to-left shunts. The study group included 27 divers who were advised to dive conservatively due to the presence of a right-to-left shunt, including a patent foramen ovale, or PFO, or with a previous history of DCS. Diving conservatively in this context meant reducing the nitrogen load by limiting dive depth or dive time or using nitrox. Before the intervention, the 27 divers performed 17,851 dives and reported 34 cases of decompression sickness, an incidence of 19 cases per 10,000 dives, which is higher than the average 2 to 4 cases per 10,000 dives, which is more typical of the recreational diving world. After they were given the recommendations to dive conservatively, Researchers followed the divers for an average of 5.3 years. In that period, the subjects performed a further 9,236 dives and reported four cases of decompression sickness, that is 4.3 per 10,000 dives, nearly fourfold decrease compared to the pre-intervention period. The study therefore seems to suggest that the recommendations to reduce nitrogen load for divers who are apparently at increased risk for decompression sickness due to a PFO or some other factor may be reduced. The risk of suffering recurrent decompression sickness after a recommendation to dive conservatively became similar to the average risk in the recreational diving population, that is, close to 4 per 10,000 dives. In the future, we may see more comparative effectiveness research studies comparing the various dive computers and dive practices to one or other of the selected standards. Divers should have enough information to choose their dive profiles with confidence. So far, the first comparative effectiveness study of conservative diving seems to justify the concept, but more quantitative studies are needed.